Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm very excited because, uh, oh, can somebody turn off the music? Hi. Do people. Thank you. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I'm very excited uh, because as most of you are probably aware, we have something called a municipal election coming up. <laughs> and believe it or not, there's more to this election than videos of smoking certain things. Believe it or not. And uh, we felt that there wasn't a lot of emphasis going on some of the issues happening, so we decided to focus uh, at least one of our events on some of the policy. So that's what tonight is about. And we thought uh, youth hasn't been getting enough attention. So at-risk youth is going to be our topic tonight. And what are some of the municipal policies that might help out at-risk youth? And so I've asked three people from our community to talk a little bit about their work and what they do and what they would like to see on a municipal policy level to make their jobs easier so that they can do what they do and be good at it and not have to worry about funding drying up or whatever other issues are out there that they do have to worry about and I'm not going to pretend to know. So I'm going to stop it right there. Uh, any first timers tonight? Thank you very much for joining us. Very brave of you. And <laughs> so what we do at Why Should I Care here is we're trying to facilitate this concept of it's okay to talk about politics over beer and dinner, which is why we host it in a pub. Thank you, Duke of York. Um, beer is very important to our conversation, I'm finding. And the reason we want this is because what's happening is everybody's telling us, oh, it's impolite to talk about politics. It's impolite to talk about people, but it's okay if we're going to stick to the issues. And that's what we're trying to say. Be informed about the issues, what they are, and be confident when we discuss them. Because unless we have that kind of discourse, our political scene is not going to get any better. So thank you very much for joining us and being here tonight and adding to this discourse. So before I get any further, I'm going to get Gavin to explain what some of the house rules are for having this conversation. Because we're a civilized group. Believe it or not. Sort of. I know it's hard to believe, just look at us. <laughs> With one possible exception, who's holding this microphone? Um, thank you, my name is Gavin, thanks Terry. Uh, thank you all for coming. I saw there were quite a lot of hands went up uh, for the first time. So, uh, the way the events work is that we have some speakers, uh, they're going to speak to you, each maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, so you will see some of our volunteers uh, hanging around. There's myself, of course, Stephen, you can find Terry, maybe Roxanne, uh, maybe Ken. And uh, you will write down your name on a little piece of paper and your little question. Please remember to write down your name. I'm always surprised how many people forget that. I won't be able to find you if you don't write your name on it. So write down the name and your brief question, and then I will uh, put you in the list and come back and find you, and you can ask your question on the microphone, and we can uh, hear what our speakers have to say about it. Now, we uh, used to do that by just putting up your hand, and so we had a system called the two-handers, and we still have that system. So if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, please feel free to write it down with your name and pass it up. If, as the conversation is progressing, someone says something that makes you think of a point that's super important, it's a point that's right on topic. It directly speaks to what is happening right there on stage. It is not a question that requires a response. It is a concise, brief, important piece of information that you would like to share with us. Then I will ask you to raise two hands like this. And not hit things. Hit anything. Um, and, uh, and then I will come over and recognize you out of turn. But Please only do this if you really have a brief and directly on point comment because other guests are waiting in line uh, to be recognized in turn and uh, it is not a device for you to skip your turn and so if what you actually wind up is with a rambling comment and question then I'll just thank you for it and put it at the back of the list and we'll move on. So uh, those are the two handers. Without further ado I will give it back to Terry to introduce our speakers. Thank you Gannon. I don't know if he said the word brief enough times. So I'll say it one more time just in case. Brief. Um, <laughs> so tonight, we have three uh, very well-informed guests joining us. The first one is uh, Andre, is it Domis? Domis. Domis. 
and uh, he is actually trying to build a community center for youth up in Rexdale. He also happens to be running for Ward 2 for City Council, uh, running against um, a young Michael Ford, I believe, amongst others. And, uh, not Doug. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his projects up in the Rexdale area and uh, what kind of municipal policies he would like to see. Then followed by a gentleman, Steve Ambrose, who runs a Canadian basketball academy. And it is a basketball program for at-risk youth, and he does some pretty tremendous things. I'm going to let him talk about it. And last but not least, and probably the most attractive, is uh, Maura Lawless. <laughs> And she runs the 519 Community Center, and she does a lot of work with LGBT homeless youth. So, I'm going to get myself off stage and Andre on. Thank you. All right, we're going to do this. So, I didn't have a prepared speech today. Um, just wanted to have a conversation with this group about what we call at-risk youth. Back around uh, in the late 70s, there was a Jamaican immigrant that came over with her family and settled down in Rexdale. At around the age of 12 years old is when she came in. She went to a local school, along with her three other sisters. And by the age of 15, she had met a guy who nobody in the family liked. He was a little bit older. Um, and against the wishes of her parents, they had a relationship, uh, things moved along pretty quickly, and she ended up being pregnant and delivering a child at the age of 16. So by most metrics, or at least the ideas that we have about people who become pregnant in their teens, we assume that there's not going to be any success to be had here, especially if you live on Bright Hill, you're going to end up becoming one of those statistics. But that teenager is my mother who quit her job this past year as the executive assistant to the CEO of a mining company because she's opening up a restaurant in Yorkville and raised three, I would say, fairly successful children. There's myself, uh, running for city council in Ward 2. There's my oldest sister who just graduated from McMaster with a degree in history and, uh, and, and sorry, history and English. And the youngest one is entering her third year at University of British Columbia with economics. Then you can talk about another person who grew up in Rexdale. Um, you know, this kid was a little bit of a geek at first, but uh, you know, if you if you have certain habits and demeanors when you live out in Rexdale, you learn very quickly that you need to conform and you have to be around people that can protect you. And fell in with the wrong crowd, got into a little bit of trouble, and didn't really have any sort of skills or people in the network to put him on the right path. So if we assume that this kid is living in an at-risk neighborhood, he may end up becoming one of those statistics. But, you know, that 16-year-old that was me. I was on the path to becoming another statistic based on the community stats for at-risk youth. And here I am right now, running for city council in War II, having just quit my job as compliance manager for Sun Life Financial. Let's talk about another at-risk youth, somebody who grew up in Malvern. His father was actually, when I say a pimp, I mean, I don't mean he dressed really well. What I mean is, he actually lived off the avails of prostitution type of pimp. He, you know, his, uh, this, this, this kid grew up in foster homes, um, around a lot of uh, people in his life that, you know, had, had drug habits, uh, were violent, belonged to gangs. He lost a lot of friends, actually, growing up um, to gang violence. And yet today, he's one of my best friends. His name is Ken Bryan. Yeah, you know, I really wish he could be here tonight. He's actually um, helping set up a hotel to become one of the hotspots for the film festival. Ken is actually one of Toronto's biggest nightclub promoters. He works for Charles Caboot, who owned the former government nightclub and actually owns a hotel and several other nightclubs. So when we talk about, quote-unquote, at-risk youth, what are we talking about here? Are we... Well, first of all, I'm not even really cool with the phrase at-risk youth for several reasons. What are they at risk for? at risk of not having proper access to education, at risk of not having enough access to, to transportation, to quality health care, to professional networks that when they graduate from school they can actually find a job or learn a trade. Or are they at risk of fulfilling stereotypes and prejudices and preconceptions that we've already had about them? 
So when we have the conversation about at-risk youth, we're not really talking about the youth, we're talking about ourselves. We're talking about what sort of opportunities are we as Torontonians and Canadians offering to people who just happen to not grow up in the right neighborhood or didn't happen to win the genetic lottery. When we talk about at-risk youth, are we talking about have we deliberately placed obstacles in people's path to almost ensure that where their parents were, they're going to end up tomorrow? So, without belaboring the point, I'm not here to talk about my candidacy for, for War II. What I'm here to talk about is the young people in my community that I see every single day that don't have the kinds of opportunities that kids in other neighborhoods would normally grow up with. In the Toronto Community Housing Building, where I spent my teens, it's almost literally a concrete jungle, in the sense that it's right on the corner of Queen's Plate and Rexdale Boulevard across the street from the Woodbine Racetrack, and it's a self-enclosed community. You literally have to walk through a tunnel, uh, dug through the building to get to the outside world, to get even to Woodbine Center. There's a rec center inside of this concrete jungle, but the kids can't even use it. So if you want, as a young person in that neighborhood, to get inside the rec center and play basketball, you've got to pay for it. People who want to come in from outside and create a basketball program can do so, but if you happen to live in the neighborhood, good luck. So you actually have, outside of this awesome rec center, a really tiny playground, and the saddest looking basketball night you ever saw. Just one of those lonely, like with the net hanging, hanging down, the kind of net you would see in somebody's driveway, you know, pulled out during the summertime. And, you know, it's been sitting in the garage for several months of the year being eaten away by rats. It's, it's a really sad looking basketball net. So my question is, why is it that those children do not have the same kinds of opportunities that somebody who grew up, let's say, right down in here, in this neighborhood, uh, in War 20, would have? Why wouldn't they have the same opportunities that somebody living in Mississauga would have? And I think it's partially because we keep using the phrase at risk. It's look, when we say at risk, we're, we're placing the responsibility on those young people to overcome obstacles and adversity and better themselves because that's the noble thing to do. But I believe it's actually more noble for us as Torontonians to make sure that we give them opportunities. So when I talk about this topic, I don't talk about these kids as at risk. I talk about them as youth without opportunities. And those opportunities were removed by us. By people who say that we simply don't have enough money to spend, and we've got budgets to maintain and to meet, and, you know, it's not my kids, why is it my responsibility to raise somebody else's child? Why should I have to pay for someone else's kid's breakfast? And these, these, these inwardly focused mentalities that we have that distract from the point that the best neighborhoods and the best cities are the ones that invest in their young people. Now, the idea that I had for a youth center, it's, you know, it, you can't really sum it up as just calling it a youth center. Here's, here's what I'm looking at. At Albion Library, there is a pilot program where kids can drop into the library and play video games. Now, Albion Library is the library that I was in most often when I was young, and uh, that's where I credit all the book learning that I got. You know, I started writing that library. And anything that will actually bring a child into a library, to me, is a good thing. Anytime that you put a library up in a community, the crime rate almost instantly goes down, right? The, uh, the, the educational level of those kids all, almost instantly rises. And you can see that in the War II community. Those kids are actually incredibly talented and incredibly educated. For children of immigrants, in the first generation, if you look at uh, Canadians or uh, immigrants of African-Canadian origin, their children, between the ages of 25 and 34, have a university degree at a rate of 25.9%. So about 26% of first generation Canadians of African descent will have university degrees. Once you pass into the South and East Asian communities, you're looking at doubling and tripling the rate of the average Canadian as far as having university degrees. So you pull these kids into a library, you get good results almost immediately. But what if we did something more than that? What if we just did more than getting them into libraries, playing video games, hoping that they'll read some books along the way? What if we taught them how to make these video games? What if we used some of the resources we already have at our disposal? We have University of Guelph Humber sitting right in our backyard. We have massive game developers like Ubisoft, headquartered right here in Toronto. The managing director of who actually is, is, a, is a woman. What if we had organizations like DevTO putting together programs for young people to learn how to code and how to make games? So you have these university students coming in to mentor and develop young people to make these games. 
you have these industry giants coming in to you know offer classes and obviously you know uh, university students who can see them get to go and fanboy and fangirl out at seeing their heroes what if we had organizations that would actually refurbish the computers that government agencies and large companies cycle out of their inventories fairly regularly what if we're able to refurbish these computers and put them in these kids homes so that they can come in drop in learn how to code go home do the homework come back to the library the following week and show their friends the awesome game they made we already have buy-in from several different companies and several different local community organizations that say, yeah, as a matter of fact, this is a really good idea. Why didn't somebody think of it before? Well, let's take this further out to rec centers. We always say, for example, that, you know, uh, a basketball court is not really anything besides a hug and thug program, right? We can't really do much with these kids on the basketball court because they're going to come in, they'll burn off energy, they'll go back out in the street and do the same thing they're, they're going to anyway. To which I say, okay, let's assume that's even true. We have the Raptors in Rexdale fairly frequently because uh, you know, there's a couple of organizations and companies that are fairly friendly with them. What if we had people from Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment come out to a rec center, this hypothetical future rec center, to teach these kids? Well, you know, a basketball team is 12 people, and it's a really, really small amount of, like, it's a very, very vanishingly small percentage of people in the world that'll ever play on a professional basketball team. But behind those 12 people is a massive juggernaut. There's an industry behind them. Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment is huge. So let's say that you were to get a you know, degree in accounting, pair that with your love of basketball, now you can work in the Raptors uh, head office. Why not become a physiotherapist? Why not become a talent scout? Let's say that you like uh, rap music. Why not learn how to become a sound engineer? Why not learn how to become a producer? So my ideas for War II aren't necessarily just for War II. My ideas for at-risk youth in War II which, again, I would like to call youth without opportunities. My ideas are more along the lines of, why aren't we removing the obstacles that they already have to not becoming at risk? Why are we not trying to give them more opportunities? Why are we not connecting them directly with the industries and with the people that can help them? So as we continue on, I really want to have this conversation with you guys because I want to hear more ideas. You know, the more that we can generate this conversation, especially in neighborhood houses like Raxdale, um, the better that we can do out there. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Ambrose. Uh, thanks for having me, Terry. Thanks, Paul and, and Bao for coming out. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about my experience and uh, my program uh, called the Canadian Basketball Academy. Give me a sec here. I'll just stand. All right, so uh, my name is Stephen Ambrose, like I said. Um, a bit about who I am first. Uh, I'm a graduate from UT. Uh, member of the Canadian For Armed Forces, uh, professional player. I also coach for the past 15 years in, in Toronto and overseas as well. On the flip side of that, I'm from an at-risk community called Lawrence Heights, uh, literally a concrete jungle, uh, nickname is Jungle. And um, it was a really tough upbringing there. A single parent home, all the stereotypes. I know about two dozen people have been murdered in the city of Toronto alone. And uh, I was also homeless at one point trying to go to school. So I agree with a lot of what Andre said. Um, through all that, I was able to do the first list of accomplishments because someone or people engaged me at one point or another. And so that's what I want to discuss uh, here with you guys today. So my program called the Canadian Basketball Academy, it's a really unique program. Uh, it engages not only at-risk youth, but youth from all over Toronto, um, especially in affluent neighborhoods as well. Uh, we run all of our programs in Forest Hill, North Toronto, and Lee side, but it's unique in that we we bus kids in from all over the city, all over the GTA, right into those into those areas, so that um, we can not only offer them a safe, uh, structured environment, but also it raises the level of competition in these other areas as well. So that's in terms of, of basketball. We've done a lot with the little that we started with. We've been around for about four years. We have uh, about we have over 1,200 people in our program currently. 1,200 kids in our program currently, and we're looking to double in the next two years as well. Um, we've fundraised about $300,000 to give kids opportunities that they would not otherwise have, and we've done that on a shoestring budget, and we're, we're in the process of becoming a million dollar company by our projections for, for this year. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you guys about specifically was how to engage you 
Um, for me personally, uh, I was expelled from the Toronto District School Board at the age of eight. So I was in grade, I was in grade three, I was expelled, and that's probably the best thing that happened in my entire life. <laughs> so I remember being, uh, once I transferred schools, once the school would actually let me back in, it was a school about 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers away from my house, I was forced to take public transit at the age of eight. One lunchtime, uh, teach, I came back from lunch and the teacher, I asked the teacher if I could go back out to use the washroom, and they said, why? I said, well, I forgot to use it during lunch. And he then told me, well, it must not have been that important. If you forgot to do it, get your ass inside. So that was the first time in my entire life that I didn't have an opportunity to, to be entitled. And that bred in me a bunch of great things like responsibility. And um, being in that environment uh, where uh, I was removed from my former neighborhood and I was mixed in at, say, York Mills and Baby with these much more affluent kids, um, it saved me from a lot of ills in my community because after school, I was studying with my friends who weren't from my community, so I didn't have to go home. I didn't have to uh, face the drug dealers on the corner who said, you can't take this way home, go around, or let me check your pockets, right? I even see someone from my community right here who can attest to all of this stuff. But um, good to see you, by the way. Uh, yeah, so I think um, what our program does differently is that we, I call it, personally, I call it a, a military boot camp with basketball. And so kids aren't allowed to have a sense of entitlement. Every single year we provide them with a plethora of opportunities to travel, which is one of the keys, again, to taking them outside of their experience. We go to Europe every year, we go to Germany, Italy, Austria, next year we're going to Spain. And all of this, I fundraised, um, not alone, but through my vision to help kids, and again, on a shoestring budget. So part of what I want to see change in policy is not so much resources, because I think it's, I think the nepotism is obvious and who gets the money and what companies are assigned this money. It's more so the access to the resources that I think is the problem. A lot of these kids, a lot of these programs don't know what's out there and these are the main ones that are trying to create a difference like ours. Uh, this is our first year. We have a board of directors, a 12 member board, uh, two of our board members are here and we're in the process of becoming a registered charity. It's taken four years um, for us to get to this point and lar by and large, I've done it myself for, for this organization, but in the process, we've helped thousands of kids, thousands of kids get opportunities to get off the streets. Uh, they work up to 15 hours a week in our program playing basketball, and our policy is such that no child is turned away for financial reasons. So regardless of where you come from, the program is free. Whether you can afford to pay the entire cost, you, you can pay it, but if you can't and you demonstrate financial need, the program for you is free. So to this day, we've never turned away a single child for financial reasons, and I'm really proud of that. Um, in terms of, again, in terms of policy, to be honest, I'm not too aware about, of the political landscape, and I think that's partly because I wasn't engaged as a youth, that's my excuse. Um, but I just would like to see uh, you guys who have, who have a chance to influence policy, keep that in mind as we approach the municipal election. And I'm not, again, I'm not familiar with uh, too much of the policies, too many of the policies. But uh, that's something that I think will affect all of us because of the 24 people that, that I know that were killed or that killed other people, um, a lot of it could have been prevented had someone been told no like me, right? And, and I think that starts with everyone in this room and I, I obviously starts with myself too and I'm doing my part and so I just, I wanna encourage you just to keep an ear out, keep an eye out for how you can influence it because, again, these are gonna be your kids' friends in the future. These are gonna be the people that are shaping our nation. So uh, thanks for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Maura Lawless and I'm the executive director of the 519 Church Street Community Center. Many people here know the 519 at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, right on. Um, so the 519 is actually an agency of the City of Toronto, and we are located in downtown Toronto. And as an agency of the City of Toronto, we run a community centre that is for the local community as well as the broader LGBT community. So for those of you who don't necessarily know that acronym, that stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bi, Trans Community. And because we're located in a, in a neighbourhood which has historically been classified as the Gay Village, a lot of our programs and services have really uh, come up organically through the neighbourhood and through the community over the last number of years. So we've been in existence for about 40 years now. 
Uh, as a city agency, we receive um, core funding. We keep our building open and accessible to the community. We make sure that the community can use the space for free. And then we fundraise all of the other rest of the money for running our programs and services. So for every dollar we receive in city funding, we now raise $3.53. And the money that we use um, pays for our community programs and services, and so it's incredibly important for us in terms of the work that we do in advancing kind of social inclusion and the, and the it, it, it initiatives associated to programs and services that we raise our money. Um, I think the reason that we were asked to speak a little bit today is we've done quite a bit of work um, over the last five to ten years in advancing LGBT inclusion in the City of Toronto and with a particular focus on changing the way that shelter services and services are for marginalized queer youth. Um, for those of you who don't know, back in the 1990s there were three trans sex workers who were murdered in one weekend in the City of Toronto. And at that time there was an outrage within the LGBT community and a number of people um, got together at the 519 and they started a program uh, really looking at providing support services for trans sex workers. And they're an extraordinarily marginalized community. Uh, they face uh, enormous discrimination and violence. Um, and they came together, and through that, they um, built this program called the Trans Access Program. And what the Trans Access Program does is it takes peer sex workers and it mentors them and provides them education and training uh, support services and creates an opportunity for them to deliver workshops and learn uh, job readiness skills. And they also deliver training. Uh, training is one of the central things that we do at the 519. And so what we've done over the last uh, probably 10 years is trained over 30,000 people in the shelter system who are providing services and human service work in terms of how to improve access for trans people. Because a lot of trans folks face enormous barriers in relation to the, the shelter system and in relation to human services generally. So what we did from that experience is then became quite involved as an organization in terms of the issues impacting marginalized LGBT people who face a lot of barriers in relation to accessing services in terms of accessing shelters. So as an organization, we've spent a lot of time um, advocating with the City of Toronto to change the shelter standards. The shelter standards now require that they are LGBT inclusive, um, and they are actually require agencies to actually develop trans accessible policies. But we didn't think that that was enough, and we certainly know from our experience at the 519 that, pay, again, uh, we certainly knew that there was a large number of LGBT youth who were in the shelter systems. They were identifying to us that the, 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 the spaces were very unsafe. They weren't accessible for a lot of queer folks, and lots of queer folks then were, in fact, not actually being able to access support services. And, w and we knew that that was not uh, appropriate, and we knew that the, the City of Toronto really had to change the way that it delivered services. So in 2012, we partnered with a number of LGBT-focused organizations, and we met with the City of Toronto. And we talked to them about the incredible importance of actually doing m better demographic analysis of LGBT homeless folks. And so in 2013, it was the first time the City of Toronto added LGBT um, as part of the demographic analysis and the street needs assessment. And it was through that survey, many of you ha may be aware of this, that they learned that the LGBT folks are well overrepresented. They represent 25% of the LGBT or uh, of the youth in the in the in the shelter system, which is significantly higher than the general population. So at that time, the, the city of Toronto, um, I think, uh, at some level, was shocked by the statistical results. We certainly weren't. We thought we told you guys so. Um, but then they actually went about and. I think did some very thoughtful engagement processes. So they've established a working group uh, with the city. They are working on their shelter standards, which are actually looking at the ways of, of ensuring compliance in relation to shelter services and how those run. Um, and they've been very conscious about making sure that they do good communication, good um, outreach, and good development in relation to the review of the shelter standards. And then, of course, they've just recently released an ROEI uh, or an expression of interest uh, for community organizations to look at the development of, of LGBT housing and or LGBT support services. There is no dedicated shelter, system, shelter uh, or housing project in the City of Toronto that's specifically focused on the needs of LGBT youth. Not only are they, again, the 25% uh, in the population, but there are no dedicated support services that are specifically designed to meet the needs of, of, of this marginalized community. For many people who are marginalized and queer youth, they face, a, a, again, a significant barriers. Their family is, uh, in many cases, the, the principal reason that LGBT youth are homeless is because their family has rejected them. 
Um, they move down into Toronto, they go into the shelter systems. Uh, they're profoundly unsafe uh, for many kids um, and many folks, and we deal with a lot of those folks uh, in our organization. Um, we also know that a lot of the queer youth that we deal with um, actually face significant um, mental health issues in relation to suicide ideations. And so we're dealing with lots of folks who really do um, need support, and they need to be in a system that is supported and actually working with them to uh, address their long-term housing uh, stability needs. So for us as an organization, um, our perspective in relation to why, why this matters is that access is a fundamental right and it's a human rights issue. And many points in relation to the way the, the City of Toronto delivers services, they're profoundly progressive, but when you get at an operating level within the City of Toronto, a lot of the, the really good equity work um, and equity framework that exists within um, the shelter standards does not get actualized or realized in relation to on the ground level. So we really think it's incredibly important that the City of Toronto continues to push policy changes that improve access and equity for everybody who accesses our shelter systems and our, and, our, and our social housing. And we believe that it's important through quality assurance review processes, through public accountability mechanisms, through the complaints process, and through ongoing training, that the systems that provide support services for the most marginalized in our community are taking an active, engaged step and role in relation to addressing access barriers. And in fact, that there's, there's degrees of public accountability. The one thing that we know fundamentally from a public policy perspective is the more the leadership exists at the City of Toronto, certainly, um, in terms of embracing the concepts of equity and inclusion, the better the outcomes are for our city, the better the outcomes are for the individuals who are impacted by our social services. And we believe ultimately that when that level of leadership is fully engaged in relation to the work that they do, that we actually have much broader and better outcomes. So that's my really quick duty in terms of what um, I was going to speak to today. The one thing I would do is, the other thing that we do at the 519 is we do a significant amount of training and education. And li a little later on, actually I'll do it right now. I'm just going to distribute these so folks can have these, pass these out as well. We have a campaign at the 519 right now which is called Hear It and Stop It. And it's an LGBT workplace inclusion campaign. So I encourage you to take a look at this as you're kind of going forward and take a look at our website. It tells you all about the kind of initiatives our organization is working on in terms of addressing homophobia and transphobia in the workplace. So thank you very much. That's my quick comment. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers. Time for questions now.